Okay. Our test is still scheduled for Thursday. Um, I did put up the essay, so I want to go over those first. So if you can go to your Canvas page, feel free to file in whenever you need to. It is cold in here today. I apologize for that. It's true. It's true. So, oh, here's that number, that beautiful number that lets me know that three days past the due date, we are 25 out of 44 on the PSD number twos. I'm starting to wonder if I gave that seven day grace period, if people just now assume that to be on the, the new due date. Um, you are getting points taken off if it's late, so you know, unless you at least talk to me ahead of time to let me know. I did. You have a legitimate excuse. And you also did it the right way, which is proactive. I've been, I've been very consistent about that part. Anyway. For those 19 of you, if you fall into that category and get that PSD number two in, that would be great. Be a good thing to do this week. Yeah. Uh, but the other thing that you probably want to do is start studying for the exam, which is on Thursday. Um, let me go to essays. So these are due on Friday. And of course, you've got a very wide variety of things that you can talk about. Some of these things we haven't gotten to yet, um, and I hope to get through them in the next couple of days, um, but I just at least want to go over those with you so that you know what I'm talking about. The first one is kind of specific to socialism, but it would incorporate utopian socialism and then Marxian socialism, so bong and bullet. It says discuss the evolution of socialism. So the beginning of it, you're going to want to have a decent body paragraph on utopian socialism. What was its framework? Who were some of the adherents? What were some of their works? And then the second part is a pretty definitive paragraph on Marx and how Marxian socialism works or what dialectical materialism is. And then the third says what impact did socialist thought and action have on the revolutions of 1848? Well, we haven't talked about the revolutions of 1848, but I can tell you that socialism only appears in one of those revolutions. There are revolutions that broke out all over Europe, but France is the only one that really encountered a working class wrinkle uh, that was part of the, the 1848 revolution. Whether it was Marxian or not, it doesn't really matter, but we definitely know that Utopian socialism was very much a part of France in the 1830s, and there is no way uh, that France, who were like the political revolution champs, are going to ignore that, that thing. But what you watch take place, which is interesting, is the exact thing that was happening between 1789 and 92 was happening again in 1848, where there was an initial uprising against the conservative order but the liberal bourgeoisie wanted to control how that revolution would proceed and then put a termination point on it. And then the working class felt like the revolution wasn't going to benefit them. But instead of it unwinding over the course of three years like it did in the original French Revolution, this broke out into a civil war uh, in the 1848 revolution. It's called the June Days Revolt, and we'll definitely talk about it. All right, so the second one then is about Vienna, and there's a couple of choices on Vienna for those that want to write about it, but it says, the reactionary agreement signed at Vienna made the revolutions of 1848 predictable. Um, and so, obviously, it's a discussion about conservative philosophy. Uh, for those of you that paid attention when we were looking at the Congress of Vienna, obviously, we know that they did some good things, but they ignored the fact that the ideology that supported the French Revolution and Napoleonic era was not going to go away. And that's the liberty, fraternity, equality stuff that the conservatives just thought if they could put a big blanket on it, uh, they could pretend that it didn't exist. That's the mega stuff that we were talking about. Okay. 
Number three, then, is all about the revolutions of 1848. We will get to the beginning of that tomorrow. We'll probably finish it on Wednesday. And then if you want to write about it, you're welcome to do that. If you want to get a jump start on it, uh, Vialt chapter 22 is all about the revolutions of 1848. Right, that's the, the meat of it, um, all of the specifics, if you will. Number four uh, is, we'll start dealing with that tomorrow, but it says the rulers of France um, from 1815 to 48 ignored the French Revolution while the citizenry did not. Uh, you more or less just have to answer that uh, and then give us some rationale as to why that's true if you agree with the statement. Number five we didn't get to, that was going to be on Friday. Um, I stayed home with my son. Um, but the Romanticism period, if you looked at it, uh, this is the essay I told you was going to happen, all right, which is the Romantics themselves had both a love of the French Revolution and an abhorrence of the Industrial Revolution. So if you're writing this, you want to look at the different mediums of Romanticism. You could choose music, you could choose literature, you could choose art, like visual art. Uh, but you want to make sure that you're answering both of those prompts. And the, a good essay will have excerpts from writers and what they wrote that represent either a love of the French Revolution or an abhorrence of the Industrial Revolution, and you want to do the same thing with the art. Uh, six I'm going to deal with today, uh, but it's looking at Britain. And Britain did something very cool, um, where they started out reactionary conservative and then realized that that was a bad strategy. Um, and then they started to adapt. And so the progression from Britain being a 19th century conservative power to a real modern social democracy had one of the least violent pathways. Right? And it looked like it wasn't going to start out that way, but ultimately it kind of righted its own ship. Right? And that comes through legislation and a lot of things, but we're going to look at some of that today. Seven is all about nationalism, but it says theory and practice. Some people will look at like nationalist groups, uh, but you won't actually look at the nationalist theorists, and you want to be able to include both. Eight is about classical and modern liberalism, um, and it says voices on both sides. But the last part is, which should, should be answered in the conclusion, was why it was both practical and inevitable for modern liberalism to be there in the first place. And we talked about that. But classical liberalism nowadays is like modern conservatism. And there was a point in time when liberalism shifted to like what we kind of consider nowadays liberalism. And the question is, was that humanitarian, humanitarian directed or was it kind of forced upon them? And I guess that's the essay that I'm looking for, is for you to be able to answer that question. Any questions so far? That's about half of them. Okay. Number eight then, oh, then we just said eight. Nine is another uh, Congress of Vienna question. It's pretty self-explanatory. And then we get to 10 and 11, all right? And if you look at the top, it says this. I am perfectly aware that we practically wrote questions 10 and 11 in class. Choosing them is perfectly acceptable but life is about finding challenges and meeting them. Just saying. All right. In other words, I have given you easy outs because we literally wrote these questions. All right. That's the remember the British industrial advantage. Why was the continent behind? How did the continent catch up? And I gave you like anywhere from like five to fourteen reasons for each of those things. That essay is written for you. Right, so you'd almost have to be brain dead to not do well on that question. But then, there's nothing that I can do to prevent you from doing that question. But, come on, is all I'm saying. You're, you're totally entitled to do that question. Uh, but, is all I'm saying, but. All right, number 11 kind of follows in the same path, although, the problem solving and necessity also included the agricultural revolution. 
um, and I gave you the five areas where you would do the analysis. And then 12 is more of an impact of the Industrial Revolution on the working class. Remember, in the first chapter, there was three essays. So 10, 11, and 12 are those three essays. Okay. All right. Anybody have any questions about any of that? I think that's fair. You have 12 things that you could write on. Um, varying degrees of difficulty, um, but choose wisely. It's due at 11.59 p.m. on Friday, but me basically announcing due dates at this point almost seems like, I don't know, but whatever. Somebody can go. It's due on Friday. You understand what I'm saying. All right, let's go to notes. And we're going to start, and basically what we're looking at here is what's happening in Europe from the time that Napoleon falls to these 1848 revolutions. And the overview of this is pretty simple. You have a collision that is taking place between conservative ideology, those are the people that are in charge in most countries, and then these forces of change that are in the form of liberalism or nationalism or socialism or some kind of mixture of each. Does that make sense, Mary? It seems like we've got a lot of people absent today, do we? Or is this class just small now? Um, Rum shop. Reagan. Reagan. Yeah. All right, so, so we got some absences. That's cool. All right. <laughs> Chapters 20 and 21 go into notes, go into isms, no, I'm sorry, politics, 1814 to 48, and it's the very top set of notes. It says AP, European History, Unit 6, Chapter 21, New and Revised, or something like that. All right. Now, there's, the first thing is kind of a separate story, but we're going to tell it anyway. And before I do that, the reading assignments, if you look at Vialt. There's like four chapters of stuff that kind of go along with what we're going to be doing the next couple of days. There's the very end of chapter 16, which was the Congress of Vienna chapter, and also talks about this Greek independence movement, which I am going to talk about. Um, and then there is a section on Britain and France in the same time period. That's chapter 18. Then there's a chapter 19 called the Conservative Order in Central and Eastern Europe. You're going to read that chapter, but you can ignore the stuff on Russia, because we're not going to get to that yet. And then chapter 22 is the Revolution of 1848. And that one you ought to read, because that fills in all of the substance. And most likely what I'm going to do with that is just kind of give you the overview, uh, because the 1848 like follows a very, very predictable um, narrative. Every one of the revolutions has the exactly the same kind of narrative. So we'll, I'll explain what the narrative is and then you can fill in the details. Anyway, so the Greek independence movement is pretty simple. Let me give you, let's see if I can find a piece of art here. And not art per se, but a map. Okay, I want to show you map of Europe, 1815. Let's see if we find something cool. Images. I don't know. Yeah, that one looks pretty good. It's actually a map of Europe in 1815. Um, ooh, that's even cooler. Look at that. That's exactly what I want. All right. So here is the Russian Empire. Here is the Austrian Empire. And then here is the Ottoman Empire. And this region is referred to as, starts with a B, the Balkans. <laughs> Bulgaria, the Bosnia. No, it's, the region is called the Balkans. And this is southeastern Europe that at one time was controlled by the Ottoman Empire. And in fact, even this region up here, all the way to this boundary, at one time was under Ottoman control, but Austria had gobbled that up, and they did so between 1683 and the early 1700s. Right? But nonetheless, 
what you're looking at in this time period is very intense nationalism. And we talked about that. Nationalism as, uh, as a, one of the isms is the fact that people are starting to get in touch with that identity, whatever that happens to be. And then once that realization hits, then they act upon that because they realize that maybe that identity is not realized in a political space. Okay? That happens, it's going to happen and make vulnerable the Austrian Empire, eventually the Russian Empire, and certainly the Ottoman Empire. There's a whole bunch of subject nationalities that are going to kind of get aware of the fact that they are under somebody else's control. And in this story, Greece is definitely amongst them. All right, so Greece is the word. Those of you that are familiar with that. So the Greeks, immediately after Napoleon, I told you that's a big deal. Napoleon is like a, a midwife between what's taking place in the French Revolution and then his movement that kind of sweeps across Europe. And the Greeks are infected by it, as a lot of people are. Right? They're in touch with their Greekness. And the Greeks have been under control of somebody under somebody else's control for centuries now. All right? And they're identifying this great cradle of Western civilization, and they're starting to rise up against Ottoman control. And the Ottomans don't like it. So in this period between 1815 and 27, we start to see freedom fighters and Greeks that are rising up in the same way that maybe Catalonia is rising up now, or in the same way that the Kosovars were rising up in the late 90s, or whatever the case may be, the Kurds. Uh, but there is definitely a subject group of nationality called the Greeks. They are rising up against the Ottoman Turks, and the Turks aren't really down for it, meaning shut up, stop it. And then the rebellions are starting to get a little more vocal. And they're starting to get violent. And there's backlash that's coming from the Ottoman Turks. But the newspapers are then blowing it into this massive, massive atrocity that is being committed by the evil Turks against the poor, innocent Greeks, who now all of a sudden are getting um, a lot of airplay, especially among Western European romantic poets and painters, and writers, etc., etc. Hello. There's a leader by the name of Alexander Ypsilanti. He is their William Wallace. He is their freedom fighter. All right. Eugene Delacroix, if anybody paid attention to the romantic reading, that actually reads people in this class that read things that are assigned. One of them was the Romantics, and one of the leading painters of the Romantic era is a Frenchman by the name of Eugène Delacroix. His painting was called Massacre at Chios. A lot of the Romantic paintings are designed to elicit emotion. All right? You're watching an atrocity committed against innocent Greeks by marauding Turks. And there was this site called Chios, where supposedly one of these attacks was carried out against people that were literally fighting for their freedom. Now, Romantics, of course, they're all about the freedom. Right? Very excited about it. So much so that even Lord Byron, author of Don Juan, will then enlist to help the Greeks fight for their independence. And now it's the poet's war, because all of the Romantics are looking at Greece and saying, this is where Western civilization began, man. This is where art and philosophy and politics and all of those things, this is their point of origin. And now these folks are, are fighting for their freedom and the Turks are preventing them for, from achieving liberty. So now everybody's surrounding it. But what makes it sinister is that this all becomes a play that exposes a massive conflict that is on the horizon here in the Eastern European theater, if you will. That Russia, who's really been acting to expand its boundaries since like 1300, right? 
But their their primary objective in the 19th century is to get access to this waterway right here. Does everybody see it? This is the Black Sea. That's the Crimea. This is the Turkish Straits. This is the Aegean Sea. This is the Eastern Mediterranean. Russia's primary objective is to get a warm water port in the Eastern Mediterranean. And that they had been pushing for that even up to the point that Napoleon eventually got involved in that region and then the British and the French were kind of fighting it out over supremacy in the Eastern Mediterranean. But now Russia is using this and using the peace after Napoleon and looking at this region here as the most vulnerable section. And they are going to do whatever they can, be friend of the Ottoman Empire, be foe of the Ottoman Empire, in order to try gain influence for the purposes of achieving this objective, which is access to a warm water port. So, the Greeks have been fighting for their independence. Guess who signs up to be a big champion for Greek freedom? Russia. The Russians. Why? Because if the Greeks get their independence, or the Greeks get their freedom, and Russia were, was the country that helped them get their freedom, what might be in it for Russia? Warm water ports. Warm water ports. Look at all of these warm water ports that the Greeks would say, thanks Russia, and the Russians would be like, it's cool. Do you mind if we set up some ports here and start building up a naval you know, presence? And guess who desperately wants to prevent that from happening? Britain. Okay? And to a lesser extent, France. So when Russia jumps in to the Greek independence movement, guess who also jumps in to the Greek independence movement? The British and the French. Now you've got three major freaking powers that are going to fight on behalf of the Greeks against the Ottomans, and the Ottomans really haven't been powerful since the late 1600s. Think there's a chance that the Ottomans are going to be able to hold on to Greece? No. Absolutely not. And, if you look at the notes, here's how it plays out. Okay? So the Treaty of London, Great Britain, France, and Russia demand the Ottomans to recognize Greek independence. What are their motives? Russia doesn't give a damn about Greek independence. Okay? They can wear all the blue and white shirts they want. The fact of the matter is they could give a damn about Greek independence other than it might be able to help them fulfill their self-interest if they seem interested. Okay? The French and the British also don't really give a damn about Greek independence. But they see it as potentially a check against whatever Russia is trying to accomplish. So we will fight basically so we can keep an eye on Russia. And this is true. If you look at the treaty, it doesn't take but like a couple of months for the Greeks to achieve their independence. But there's a treaty that is signed called Adrianople, where Serbia was able to extricate themselves from Turkish control. Russia was able to gain some land at the expense of the Ottoman Empire, and they became protectors of these two territories called Moldavia and Wallachia. These are territories that comprise present-day Romania, and they are smack dab in the middle of the Balkans. Okay, let me see if it shows up on the map. There they are, Moldavia and Wallachia. What? Would the Greeks have gotten their independence like anyway, like in the long run? Oh, it would have taken a hell of a lot longer. And there's a good chance that maybe not, because they had been working on it for 12 years and had not really uh, gained any traction against the Turks. But it's a it's a, it's a dead issue by the time the Russians, the British, and the French jump in. Johnny, you have a question? Mm -hmm. Mary? Mm -hmm. Who? Crimea. Crimea? Crimea? Yeah, yeah. This is definitely Russian territory. And we still know about this. I mean, they've been screwing with this stuff for the last four years. So you could almost make an argument that there's nothing different about Russia's objectives now than they were 300 years ago. Okay? So here's how the, Re the British and the French deal with this. Because that's a big game. They got some territories here. They got protectorship rights over these territories. And you can see how close they're getting. 
right? This is Russian influence. But here is the landmark. This is the block right here. The Greeks get their independence, but the second treaty that is signed is called the Treaty of London, which officially recognizes the Greeks as independent, but also makes the work of recognizing a sovereign ruler and then ex making sure that the entire international arena recognizes the Greeks as a sovereign state. Okay? If they are sovereign, they can't be bossed around and told, hey, uh, we get to have access to naval bases here and there. Those are dictated pieces, those are forms of a dictated peace, and it almost makes it look like Greece has become a protectorate, uh, or the Russians have become a protectorate of Greece. That's why they signed that treaty. Okay? Greece is sovereign, but France and Britain are jumping all over the fact and heralding the fact that they are a sovereign state so that if Russia involves themselves in any way territorially, they are violating that sovereignty. Right. And so it's kind of like that, you know, like, uh, what's that, from Dora the Explorer. Yeah, swiper, no swiping. They're freaking swiper, the fox, right now, uh, for the Balkans. Okay? And this is some stuff that I'll talk about later, but this is, like I said, the Greek independence movement is but one in a, a number of different stories uh, that unfold between 1774 and 1856. And really, this is one of the main reasons why World War I is going to start, because of Russia trying to influence the, this Balkan region. Okay. All right, so here's the next thing. Liberalism and socialism versus conservatism in Great Britain. Okay? And remember, the, the essay that I gave you said the British started out kind of Russian. Right? And what I mean by that is that they had landowning aristocrats that had dominated their political structure. And then they passed legislation that was only going to benefit them at the expense of everybody else. And the government at the time, and remember when I said, like, the glorious revolution is neither glorious nor a revolution? Right? The reason why is because even though, yes, parliament exists, and there is a constitution, and there is a bill of rights, and all of that stuff, if you really fast-forwarded between 1688 and 1815, there isn't a whole lot that's different about Britain. Okay? Yes, they have a robust middle class, but a lot of those middle class don't even have the right to vote because they don't possess enough property qualifications to actually vote or to take a seat in the House of Commons. The House of Lords is all lords. It's dominated by the old landowning aristocrats, and they've more or less manipulated a lot of the, the, uh, the, the different voting districts so that landed aristocrats are also taking their seats in the House of Commons. So only 6% of the adult male population had enough property qualifications to vote in parliamentary elections. And the prime ministry was dominated by this old group of um, landed aristocrats called the Tories. Tories equals conservatives. But Tories in the early 19th century is definitely the old, like, earls and dukes and viscounts or whatever the hell you want to call them. Right? That's who's running Britain. And Remember, the Napoleonic revolutions happen. Liberalism exists, okay? Merchant oligarchs and other people like that exist in Britain. And it's like, we can't go on like this. So the, the battle looked a lot like the American Revolution taking place in Britain this time, right? And it all centers around this thing called the Corn Laws. Is anybody familiar with the Corn Laws? Anybody read about it? I feel bad asking this question because it seems like nobody's going to say yes. All right. So the Corn Laws. It's not really corn. Right? I wouldn't say that Britain is a major <coughs> corn producer. But it is grain. It is wheat. It is definitely like stuff that people eat. All right. So here's how it goes down. In the Napoleonic era, remember Napoleon had that thing called the Continental System, which was designed to try to like create a massive trade barrier against the rest of Britain and like isolate them economically. 
So that, at least to some extent, worked. And Britain basically was left to their own agricultural production. That if they faced harvest disasters, they would have been in real deep duty. Because whatever they produced in the United Kingdom is what fed the people in the United Kingdom. And the bread prices could get pretty high at times. All right? But then Napoleon wins. Or, I'm sorry, Napoleon loses. Mm -hmm. Britain wins. And Europe wins. And there was a belief among a lot of people that, okay, you know, we had to make sacrifices because we were fighting against Napoleon and the Continental System, but we have defeated Napoleon. So there was an expectation that after that, they would open up trade again. And that if, you know, bread prices were high, well, they would get lowered because of the competition that would be involved in grain uh, imports. Like Denmark, or Eastern Europe, or Central Europe, or other Scandinavian states would be able to bring their wheat and put it into the British marketplace, and then the competition would ultimately drive the prices down. Well, who's running the show in, in Britain? Who has all the seats? The landowning aristocrats. And they kind of looked around and said, you know what? We found something out about that Napoleonic era. We were the only ones that were making any money in grain production, and we kind of dug that. So they sought to try to put up tariffs around their markets that they monopolized and said, we will not allow for the importation of grain unless our bread prices get to disaster levels. So what does that mean? That means that they can raise the prices to just a smidge under disaster levels, and then they can benefit from the profits that they gain. Because people have to eat, right? So you'll pay those prices. Now who's pissed? Everybody. That's the one time that you can bring the liberals and the socialists together. Because if you're a manufacturer, why would you be against this policy? What do you think? That's right. The manufactured sector is going to take a hit because manufactured goods are kind of predicated on the fact that the agricultural markets are going to be stable. All right, people can't buy manufactured goods if they have to spend all their money on food. All right, so the traders are not doing very well. Ideologically, the traders aren't happy because you want to open up the marketplace so that you can trade your wares to other people and you can purchase your wares from other people. They're not happy about the regulation of the marketplace. They're about as happy as the American colonists were when all of those stamp acts and sugar acts and all that other crap were going down. Okay, and they were despondent about it. But who's going to buy them? Yeah, I mean, maybe there's people in other countries that will buy their goods. But you, if you put tariffs against our agriculture, how willing are we going to be to buy your manufactured goods? It's kind of like you tariff us. Jonah, can you get that? I'm going to show you. Thanks. Never mind. We're good. All right, so that's how it's going down, and obviously the protests are going to be about as vigorous as the protests you would have seen in Boston or Philadelphia in the 1760s. Okay, they're like, what the hell is going on? The workers are obviously going to be upset because either a they're unemployed because of the the decline in manufacturing demand, or they're just plain old upset because they're starving and bread prices are sky high. So there's all kinds of things that are going on. But some of the biggest attacks are going to come from liberals, people that would identify in that way. So when you hear about William Cobbett and Major John Cartwright and Henry the Orator Hunt and all of those folks, those are your Samuel Adams and your Patrick Henrys and that crew. All right? They're not happy about this, literally, um, this kind of conservative monopoly that is denying people a lot of ability to be able to trade or to make money. Okay? So there's protests. And the way that Britain handles these protests initially is to fire into the crowd. It's like, how to start a revolution, take two. 
All right. So instead of Boston Massacre, we get Peterloo Massacre. And that's really from 1815 to 19, that's what it looks like. Like Britain is on the verge of having a revolution where liberals and, and workers are going to overthrow the conservative order if the conservative order doesn't start making modifications. And ultimately, the conservative order makes modifications. Because sometimes adapting or passing out at least a little bit of uh, legislation to benefit the people that are upset is better than having those upset people overthrow the order. So that's ultimately what ends up happening. In the 1830s and 40s, we witness an adaptation in Britain. Okay, The Whigs ultimately start to gain a little bit of traction uh, in the political system. And there's a major reform bill that is passed called the Reform Bill of 1832. And if you read about it, essentially what it does is it's going to extend the franchise to the middle class. So it almost doubled like the number of people that are now qualified to hold office or to qualify to vote for people to hold office. And it gave the middle class, like the authentic middle class, bankers and merchants and traders and all of those folks, it gave them really the dominant voice in the House of Commons. Okay? It also ended practices which are very familiar uh, in the United States. Uh, we call, they call them ro a pocket and rotten boroughs. But it's basically like, um, what do we call it? Gerrymandering districts. They did the hell out of that. And so they tried to deal with the gerrymandering so that there were actually people that were uh, taking their seats in parliament that actually represented the people uh, in their districts. So that they weren't like carved out into these like weird little things so that um, you know the, the system would never change. Okay. So the middle class got the right to vote, and they're getting a little bit louder, and they're starting to take control over the ministries, and we start to see some changes take place. They're moving towards free trade. Eventually, they move to an abolition of the Corn Laws, and they had a very, very large um, political movement to, to repeal the Corn Laws. It was called the Anti-Corn Law League. Very smart. Okay. Um, but that's what we witnessed. We witnessed an abolition of slavery. We witnessed a shift from mercantilism to free trade. But then we also started to witness the liberals, the Whig liberals, start to pass some legislation that was already starting to look at how discontent the working class had gotten. And that's where we saw things like the Factory Act of 1833. Or that's when we saw the Mines Act of 1842. Or that's when we saw the Ten Hours Act of 1847. Right? But we also witnessed the fact that it's not going to be long before just the middle class being able to take their seats in the parliament is, is going to yield to the fact that the working class also are going to want their seats in the political system so that their uh, needs will, will be better dealt with. And we start to see the embryo that eventually grows to become a very formidable working class political movement. It's called Chartism. All right. And on page 238 of Vialt, if you guys read that chapter, I think it's chapter 18, it will show you what the Chartists were and what they wanted. And a lot of those things they're not going to get right away, but at least you can acknowledge that there is a political movement in Britain that is a working class movement. Right? And primary among their objectives was to get the right to vote. Because if you can get the right to vote, you can put people that are going to take their seats. I mean, this is supposed to be how politics works, where you elect representatives to take your seat, uh, and they will vote for things that are supposed to benefit the people that put them in those seats. Okay? That's before like lobbying and things like that before you can pass a tax bill and then get a, a $500,000 $500, gift you know, from whatever corporate lobby uh, enabled you to pass that tax bill. Okay, so the Chartists, you'll read about Fergus O'Connor, William Lovett, the, 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 I'm sorry, the London Working Man's Association. This is all just the sentiment. Remember, I talked about proximity discontent. 
but Britain is starting to get their act together. All right. And now, not only have the liberals now sort of replaced the conservatives as being like the primary political voice in England, but they're already starting to transition to the next step. So if you look at my carefully, my carefully designed graph here, in which you have 19th century conservatism at the very beginning of the century, 1800. And then let's say that this is like 1914, right on the eve of World War I. And that this represents mega, like old school conservatism. And this represents like modern social democracy with like universal suffrage and like the like evidence of a welfare state. That Britain's path to that, to that place was about the most linear thing that you were going to see in Europe. Okay? And what this means is that there wasn't a lot of violence that preceded the movement towards that ultimate end. That these were just adaptations that Britain was able to figure out. Now there's a couple of pieces to this story that are not as clean. And one of them is going to be what we call the women's question. And the other is going to be the Irish question. Tomorrow I'm going to pick up with the Irish question, and then we'll talk about the rest of this stuff. France, Germany, and Italy, theirs kind of look like this. All right, And there's definitely a, a demarcation point where they're going to have to make those adaptations. And then Russia's line looks like this. All right. And that'll make a hell of a lot more sense when we get there. Yeah, they stayed hard, hard, hard 19th century conservatism all the way up to the point that it just exploded. Okay, remember my Lysol on crap analogy. They sprayed a lot of Lysol in the 19th century. But there was also a lot of crap that was accumulated. All right, Jonah, that's enough for today. We stop time. All right, does anybody have any questions about any of that? Yeah, tomorrow.